Hey there guys, welcome back to Mana Down Under. For this Commander Deck Tech, we are looking at Urza, the Lord High Cheat Clapper. I mean Artifasa. He is that good. Your opponent's cheeks are going to be red raw. Um, heads up, this commander is very broken, very OP. Be careful what friends you use it with, because if you're in a casual fun playgroup, it might not be too fair. This is entering the world of Leovold getting banned because he's too good kind of commander. But, breakdown. 4 mana, 1 4 human artifacer. When Urza enters the battlefield, you get a token that's equal to all your artifacts. It's a Khan token, pretty much, and it's got the same artwork, it's the same token. Very strong. The big part, which a lot of people are freaking out, tap an untapped artifact control, add one blue. Quick look at that. It's not making the artifact say they tap the blue, it's part of his cost. To produce the blue, you need to tap an untapped artifact to produce the blue. So if the artifacts don't have haste or it's an artifact creature, it doesn't matter. He still produces the mana. And then you can pay 5 mana, shuffle your library, exile top card, you may play that card until end of turn without paying its mana cost. So you pretty much randomize your deck, rip the top card, and you can play it this turn at its appropriate timing, of course. Uh, so clearly, as a fitting artifact build, majority of the deck will be artifacts, and well, the whole deck will be artifact. Um, partly for the mana production, to buff the tokens, and all our combo interactions. And in the nature of this commander, it's very combo heavy. Um, in saying that, commander, huge bomb, people are loving it. It's seeing a little bit of trial and modern, people are theming with it. Um, even people trying in Vintage and Legacy and giving it some ideas. This is the most expensive card right now in Mon Horizons. And <laughs> it's worth every penny. So, we'll go through the win conditions first, or like the idea of the deck. Paradox Engine is a massive bomb in this deck, and it kind of goes off and you can nearly go infinite in a way. So whenever you cast a spell, untap your online opponents. Well, <laughs> if all your artifacts can tap the blue mana, it doesn't matter. You don't need lands anymore, you just need artifacts. You cast a spell, by tapping your artifacts, so they'll tap the blue. You untap them all, cast another spell, untap them all, cast another one, and you can just kind of loop it together. Provided you keep drawing more gas, away you go. Isochron Scepter, same thing, but with dramatic reversal underneath, you can untap all your non lands. It's alright, all your non lands produce blue mana anyway. Um, and this can also be paired with a lot of things like our tutors or our counter spells. Mechanized Production, it's a win condition. You can put in any artifact in the deck and create more copies of them. If you simply just want to win the game, put on a Thopta token, you've got plenty of them in this deck and you'll see that later on. Or if you want some big value targets, clone them up. Mirrored and Besieged, oh, the artwork and the flavour of this card, I love it. Both options work really well in this deck. Choosing Mirren or Frixion, Mirren, whenever you cast an artifact spell, you get a 1-1 one, 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 Mer token. That Mer token can tap for blue mana. <laughs> Ooh. Um, Frixion, beginning of your end step, draw a card, then discard a card, kind of a looting star. And then, if you have 15 more artifacts in your graveyard, target opponent loses a game. <laughs> Christ. Mirren is great, just depends on the game. If you've got another win condition in mind, you want to win some way, just name Mirren. But if you don't have much of a win condition set up, name Frixion, and across the length of the game, you'll get that. The nutty thing about that, it gives you card advantage, and it says target opponent loses a game. So if you're in a multi-way game, just work your way around the table. You lose the game, you lose the game, and you lose the game. Blight Steel Colossus. Pretty simple one. It's a one shot, one kill. It's just a big old threat. He's here because we can tutor him out, we can cheat him in really easy with our own commander, and he's just hard to deal with. Aetherflux Reservoir. The life gain storm, and then you just hit him for 50. In this deck, it's quite doable because you have all these cheaper spells, which you'll see in a few minutes, and we have all this reduction and just the nature of the deck. We can cast a lot of spells in one turn and we'll gain a bit of life. And we can easily pay the 50 life and just dump someone. It is quite a viable option. And of course, of course, training grounds. Activated abilities of your creatures cost up to two less. You cannot reduce it to zero, of course. So Urza himself becomes three mana to randomize your deck and rip a card off top for free. That's getting very scary. Now let's say you have Paradox Engine out. <laughs> You pay the three mana, you play whatever spell you want for free. Uh, Paradox Engine says whenever you play a spell, you technically could play the spell you cast it. You can untap all your non lands and pay another three or whatever you need to. You can set up a loop where you just rip the entirety of your deck out. And of course, a full on artifact build wouldn't be complete without the Lattice, the Dark Steel Forge, and an Unwinding Clock combo. So, Lattice pretty much just makes every card colorist and an artifact all at the same time. Uh, Dark Steel Forge says all your artifacts are indestructible. Great, our whole board is indestructible, but their whole board are artifacts right now too. Unwinding Clock says you untap all your artifacts during each other plays untap step. 
Now you have a board that is immortal and untapped slash reset between every turn. Good luck to your opponent to deal with this. Oh, and you could chuck the new card in there, the Great Crater. Activated abilities of artifacts your opponent's control can't be activated. Well, <laughs> if all their permanents are an artifact, they can't activate any ability. So let's look at the paragraphs for Urza, like the three key areas. The first one is when he enters the battlefield, he creates a 0 0 colorist construct token that gets buffed depending on how many artifacts you control. This is a Khan Scion of Urza token, and they're quite powerful. He alone had a whole deck architect around him. So, how can we abuse it? Well, we include Khan himself, who brings card advantage and that other token to the board. So, good old Dead Eye Navigator. Remember when this was a 20 cent rare? Um, so you can pay 2 mana, exile the creature that is bonded with, return it to the battlefield under your control. <laughs> oh lord. So every time Urza enters the battlefield, you get your new token and secret all your artifacts. That token is an artifact. It can tap for blue mana. Tap your blue mana. Reset Urza again. Get another token. Tap him for mana with another one as well. And away you go. Conjurer's Closet just lets you reset your commander at the end of each turn to get another token. And plus there's plenty of artifact creatures in the deck which make a great target too. And your, your board state will eventually look like one well-oiled machine. So one of Urza's big things you can do is you can turn any generic zero mana okay artifact into a mock sapphire really. A zero mana artifact that can tap for blue mana. That's worth a couple grand on the re reserve list. Will never be reprinted, banned in pretty much every format. Urza just turns artifacts into that. That's how scary he is. So if you wanted to live the dream of having 20 mock sapphires on the board, you can do it with this deck. So the newer printed moxes are, let's say, reined in. They have a lot of conditions they have to meet them to be viable, but they still find a home. But thanks to Urza, that condition doesn't have to be met. Just play him, ignore the condition, just tap for blue. Let's take Chromox for example. You have to imprint a card into it to get a color that can be produced, but it uses the word may. So if you choose not to imprint it, it just can't produce any color. Well, that's okay. Whereas it still sets it taps to blue. Same idea with Mox Amp and Mox Opal. I like the Opal because even without a commander on the board, Metalcraft is pretty easy to pull off, so I'll probably do something. And you'll probably notice from here on, this isn't a cheap commander deck. This is a very expensive commander deck to make it very competitive. Lotus Petal, same idea. It can tap for blue mana, or without your commander early on, you can sacrifice it to lead into your commander. Except for the Moxes, I like to have artifacts that can also give us a little something something, a little bit of value where we can. So the two baubles here, one for Urza and one for Mishra, a bit fitting as well by the way. Um, they let us look at people's hands and they can draw us cards when we need to. So when we've got enough mana on the board, we can sack him to draw. But I also like the Herbal Potus and the Welding Jar here is a bit of redundancy. Both of these can offer regeneration for either an artifact or a creature. Shield Fear, just a big old 0-6 for 0 mana. This is here for early on as a good deterrent against aggro commanders. So Urza's tapping down for mana effect can also be used like an on and off switch of certain cards that provide a, a taxing or a stacks like effect. So Trinosphere, Winter Orb, Static Orb and Storage Matrix are known for being quite a lockdown piece, very taxing, but they only do this as long as they're untapped. With the commander you can tap them for blue mana and essentially turn them off so you do not suffer their effects. Let's take uh, Winter Orb for example. As long as it's untapped, Players cannot untap more than one land during the untap step. So leave it untapped during opponent's entirety of their turn, but before it comes to your untap step, tap it down for one blue mana. It's tapped, it meets a requirement, you may untap all your lands like normal, and of course all your other permanents as well at the same time. This applies to Static Orb, we can only untap two permanents. Trinosphere, which makes spells that cost less than three cost up to three, or Storage Matrix, where you gotta choose either artifact, creature, or land to untap. This can put the absolute hurt on op opponents and the whole board, but note this is very competitive, it's very sweaty, and it's expensive to do this, and you'll get a lot of hate for doing it. But the same principle can be applied to Blink and Moth Urn and Howling Mine. The Urn gives you a ton of mana based on your artifacts. Well, funny that, we're an artifact deck. Our opponents normally would get some mana, but we can turn this effect off. And Howling Mine, I never actually read <laughs> far enough into Howling Mine. If it's untapped, that player draws an additional card. Most people just accept it, everyone gets to draw a card. No, you can turn this off and on with your commander. It's pretty good. So the third part of Urza, paying five, shuffle your library, then ripping the top off and playing it for free. There's not much here we can interact with because of you randomize and then you reveal we can't interact in between. But we can take influence from Jason Mindscope to where people would brainstorm cards from the hand back into the library and then activate a fetch land to shuffle it away. We can kind of take influence from that and use it here. 
So Jace, the Mind Sculptor, of course, with Brainstorm mechanic, the actual card Brainstorm. Dreamcash does a similar effect, and even Skorrike, where we can set a hand to something that we do not want and draw a new hand. We can use these to go cards we don't need these anymore, they're not going to help us right now, put them back into our library, and then activate our commander to shuffle them away. Just a bit of max and min to get better hands. So, we have all these incredibly cheap artifacts which will all produce mana, but let's try and abuse it more. Tokens are the best route to go, clearly. Uh, Thopters are my preference, because they've got flying and a little bit of evasion built in. So Sime, the Master Thopterist, whenever you cast an artifact, you get a 1-1 Thopter token. This whole deck is pretty much Artifact Storm, really. In addition, you can sacrifice artifacts to draw cards, so a bit of advantage there. Efficient Construction, same idea, whenever you cast an artifact, you get a Thopter token. Thopter Spy Network provides a bit of passive draw, provided we have a lot of combat going on, but it also generates us a Thopter pretty much every turn. Good old Hangerback Walker, there's a good place to dump all this mana into. With mana artifacts we're producing, and all the tokens tapping for mana as well, just everything taps mana in this deck. If you have Lattice out and your whole board's an artifact and they're all tapping for mana, Hanger Back will be huge. Um, and when it dies, produce all these tokens which also can tap for mana. Good luck to your opponent. Sharding Sphinx, whenever artifact creatures deal damage, we get more thoughts of tokens so it just keeps breeding a bigger board. Battlesphere, that one card can produce 5 mana on its own, and these tokens, they gum up the board with a bit of protection. Not so much token, but a bit of value. I love Traxos, because he untaps whenever you cast a Historic Spell. Artifacts are Historic Spells, and if he's tapping for blue mana. So at one point he gets untapped, tap him for blue mana, cast an artifact, you untap him again, and tap another blue mana. He's a good mana rock, or he's just a, you know, 7-7 seven, seven beater. Ballista, a great way to sink your mana into, kind of like Hangerback Walker, provides a lot of damage and a lot of removal. Khan is a way for us to find another beatdown plan. We have all these huge artifacts, especially like I mentioned on like Darksteel Forge and Lattice. Khan can pay one mana to turn them into big beaters, another way to attack and block. Padim is here for a bit of protection, he gives our artifacts hexproof, and if we have the biggest artifact we get a bit of draw out of them too. And my personal favourite, Memnarch. What a spicy boy. He can convert things into artifacts and then steal artifacts. Now if Trading Grounds is out, Two mana to steal a target artifact can be pretty scary for your opponent, considering your artifacts are tapping for mana too. So, and there's a lot of artifacts in Commander, but because you're playing Urza, people are going to recognize the inherent danger you pose, and I'm going to go for you pretty early on. Having a bit of protection, like Lightning Greaves and Swift of Boots, will protect our Commander somewhat. And Skull Clamp is here because of the value. With all these 1 1 tokens we're generating, Skull Clamp can eat them up and draw a ton of cards. In addition, when Skull Clamp is on a creature that doesn't insta kill it, you can still tap the equipment while it's equipped for mana. Now, Mono Blue Artifact, we need a lot of control. I would like to have more than this personally, but because of our tax like effects and all the constrictions on our opponent, we don't need that many, but we need a couple to protect it. So, good old stable counter spell, nice, cheap, gets the job done. But I like my cards like Disallow, Cryptic Command, and Archmage Charm that offer us a bit of options or variety in terms of what we can do. Swan Song, nice and cheap, can hit multiple cards and can be put under the Ice Concept to get a real good gotcha moment. But the big winner in this deck is Spell Swindle. Counter target spell and you get treasure tokens equal to its CMC. If you counter a 10 mana card with Spell Swindle, you get 10 tokens and those 10 tokens all tap for blue mana. Ooh, the, the mana generation is so real. But I also like the idea of things like Capside with Buyback. Again, we have that many artifacts, we have that many tokens going on the whole tap for mana. We can afford that buyback quite easy, and if we're taxing down our opponent's board, they can't untap their lands and whatnot, we can start dismantling their board quite literally, remove their resources away. Cyclonic Rift, come out of staple at this point. But I also like to have Reality Shift in hybridization here as a bit actual direct removal. <clears throat> Artifact Blue does tutoring a lot better than most other colors, so Mystical Tutor is here to get our counter spells or a bit of protection. Word of Invention, I've gone this over reshape because even if our commander is gone, we can still utilize the improvised mechanic to help reduce it. Fabricate, Trinket Mage, of course, staples for Commander. And of course, the big boy, Arkham Dagson. He, he's getting expensive now. He lets you sacrifice an artifact creature to search for a non creature artifact and put it straight into play. He single handedly will search out all the combo pieces in this deck quite easily just by sacrificing Thopter the tokens. Very scary. Works really well with her. It's kind of like the mates drinking down at the pub. But kind of leading to a bit of support here, the old Tezzeret does wonders to this deck. Untaps artifacts, pay X 2 to for CMC of artifacts, pay 0, get all your 0 mana artifacts out. Or, Neg 5, all your artifacts become 5-5 five five beaters. That is a game win condition right there. 
or the same idea with Antiquities War, the third phase, make all your artifacts 5-5 five, five beaters. The sheer size of our board and artifact presence will win the game. And of course, I like to have a bit of artifact draw through Thoughtcast and Thirst for Knowledge, rewarding us for going on our full artifact plan. Of course, Soul Ring, this command staple, and Dramatic Reversal because Ice Crown Scepter, Infinite Combo pretty much there, or just on its own. It might be enough to reset all your mana that you need for one turn. Now the lands. We've gone with Snow Covered because they're coming back, so it's a little bit fitting, but they can min-max your commander's land base pretty well. Um, but it is more expensive, that's why I often don't mention many of my videos because you're paying $2 for a basic land slot rather than the, the free value of normal basics. But we've got 22 co snow covered, and of course we're running extra plan planar lands for that doubling land effect. But they also get a bit of support from scrying sheets where we can try and rip our basic lands off the top of our deck. In addition we have Mouth of Ronom as a bit of protection, we can just pay the 5 mana, sacrifice it, hit a creature for 4 damage. Academy Ruins. Of course, it's gonna be an artifact deck, it makes sense. I kinda wanna sneak Mind Slaver in here because this is here too and I can tutor for it pretty easy. That might be pushing the deck a bit too far, but Mind Slaver could work quite well. Inventor's Fair, Metalcraft, you gain life each turn and you can sacrifice it to tutor for more artifacts. Um, Reliquary Tail is a must have because you can draw quite a bit of cards through all your passive income. Talaria West can be transmuted out for CMC Zero. So artifact lands or other key artifact pieces at zero mana. And Darksteel Citadel and Seed of Synod just provide additional artifact slots on the board, which we care about. And that's my deck tech so far for Ezra. I've got a couple other cards here I was kind of thinking about, like, I like the idea of putting Narset, the part of Bales, in there to lock up on another multi-draw, or back to basics to punish greedy land bases. Um, even thought about putting a Pithy Needle in there, name the commander every time, but at that level, the deck is getting very competitive and it's like tournament sweaty. Even consider things like Cloud Key for overall reduction or even Laboratory Maniac. The deck can combo off with Paradox Engine and whatnot and just draw out the entirety of the deck and win the game. There are plenty of ways to build Urza. You can go real budget, you can go real tryhard sweaty, which is probably the best way to do it so you're going to get most of your value. He is an expensive deck. I see a lot of people there putting two $300 reserveless cards in there just to get a couple percentage points. But it does work. He he has three key areas which are all so powerful and interact so well. He can do a lot of things and he will become a tier one commander for sure. He's god tier. He's very powerful. Um, I can see why he's 50 bucks right now. And foils, foils are pay for the box on their own. So what do you think about Urza? Um, this deck is pretty sweaty. I'm starting to get the pieces together. I'm going to apologize now to my playgroup because you're going to have to deal with this deck soon. All right, let me know your thoughts down below, guys, and have a good one. See ya. As always, thank you to our patrons. These guys are the building blocks for Mana Down Under. They make the channel what it is. If you'd like to become a patron and see the benefits, the link is down below. And thank you again, guys, for your support. Thanks for watching, guys. Please remember to like and sub and click the bell icon for notifications. It's greatly appreciated. And if you have any deck or video ideas, just suggest them down below. And have a good one, guys.